Glad you're with us. This is the Retirement Education Hour. Hi, everyone. Megan Mozak here in the studio with financial instructors, Kurt Cassidy and Dr. Paul Mettler. And always a great time when I'm with these two. They're both with the Retirement Education Foundation, and they make it their mission at the foundation to help people just like you and me get to and through retirement successfully with the right knowledge that you need to plan for your retirement, planning for retirement here, uh, a modern retirement at least, it takes a lot of know-how. And we want to provide that to you here on the show. The foundation, they want to help you even more with the courses that they offer at major colleges and universities. And we'll be sharing all the details around those courses and how you can get registered, get a front row seat. We want to see you there. So be watching for that. We have a great program lined up for you today. We're going to dive into risk. Are you risky? Do you take enough risk? Maybe not enough. There are different types of risk to be aware of as an investor, especially an investor in or nearing retirement. And we're going to talk to Kirk and Paul about that today. Risk, gentlemen, it's a huge topic for retirees to understand. Well, it is. I think that the industry has done a poor job and we'll explain why they do this. It's intentional at almost creating a label that people can't define or really understand. So one of the things we've recognized, remember the Retirement Education Foundation is a charity that that provides advanced, almost master's level uh, retirement education. So we teach these almost master's level courses at major universities around Michigan and, and Missouri and, and a number of different places. And so after teaching for over a decade in these major universities, we've had the opportunity to meet and teach over 10,000 individuals that are within 10 years of retirement through retirement. And one consistent, we see lots of consistent mistakes, but one of the consistent mistakes that we are seeing and witnessing is people don't really understand what the risk label that they have been given or they have given themselves really means in terms of how much your portfolio could lose and whether or not you need that much risk, more risk or less risk to accomplish and achieve your goals. Our industry does a, a and I, and I want to be careful how I say this, but it's, it's, I believe, we believe it's an, they do it intentionally. They create a lot of cookie cutter, generalized concepts and rules for people to latch onto to make things more simple, scalable, create more fear and anxiety, particularly through retirement. So you spend less and they can make more. So we're going to define what it means to be a conservative, a moderate conservative, a moderate, a moderate aggressive and aggressive investor. We're going to tell you exactly how much your portfolio could lose if you have one of these labels. And then what we want to help you better understand is what do I need to give me what I want in retirement? And your plan, your plan, when you're going to spend the money, need the money, how you need the money, how much money you're going to want in retirement will define how much risk you should take. It really doesn't matter what you feel or think. That is the responsibility of your teams, your advisors. They should tell you, this is what you need to give you what you want. But instead, they depend on you to tell them how much you're comfortable with, whether it's relevant or applicable to your plan. So, Paul, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I took most of the segment, but you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's a big difference between the term we use in our industry, risk tolerance, and something we're going to dig into in the show, which is really your risk capacity. And, and too often, advisors are focusing on this thing called risk tolerance, which is actually meaningless and confusing and no one really can define it well versus risk capacity, which is actually driven by what you want, what you need and what you can afford to take. And we'll dig into that more. Uh, it, first, let's talk a little bit about our class. Yeah, it's great. We, we, we host eight hour, almost master level courses at major universities in your area. We do a full Saturday, eight hours or two evenings, four hours each evening. And to attend, all you need to do is make a $29 donation to charity. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. You know, Kirk, you said something earlier that, that you said it quickly and, and I, I want to just highlight it. You made this comment that these labels are meaningless, 
right? And, you know, so this, this, you know, you're a conservative investor, you're a moderate conservative investor, you're, you're an aggressive investor. What does that, what do those things really mean? And, you know, it just makes me think about our class. And sometimes you do this exercise in the class. And I love this exercise because I think it really highlights how meaningless these labels are. You'll ask the class, okay, so tell me, what does it mean to be a conservative investor? And people raise their hands, right? And literally five different people will respond with completely five different answers, right? It really highlights the fact that we're using these labels. We don't really understand what these labels mean. And if we don't understand what the labels mean, how do your advisors on this understand it? And then how are you really allocating appropriately? This is a, this is a big problem. Paul, that's perfect. And we'll, I, let's make sure in, in future segments today that we get back to this because I wanna, I, I'm going to give you guys some time to think about it. So if I said to you right now, you're a moderate investor, tell me what you're investing in and how much could you lose if we had a major drawdown, like a pseudo 2008 type of, or a three standard deviation for those who follow what we're saying, how much would your portfolio lose if you're a moderate investor? I want you to think about that because we're going to define by industry standards, the range of what a conservative, moderate, conservative, moderate, moderate, aggressive, and an aggressive investor could lose if we had a 2008 event or a three standard deviation event. So that's one lesson we're hoping to give you today is to help you better define what you are and what the industry is labeling, labeling you are. And I think you're going to see that there's a huge disconnect there. The second piece of this, and I think is most important, is what you're going to learn throughout today is that you all don't really have a plan. You don't. You think you have a retirement plan. You don't. And you need to go to our charity's website to watch a webinar, a 30-minute webinar on what a sample retirement plan looks like so you know what it is. And if you have a plan, then the plan actually dictates how much risk you should be taking in each one of your accounts and investments, depending on when you need those dollars to spend. So... If this sounds foreign to you, I encourage you to attend one of our almost master's level courses that are taught at major universities in your area. It's eight hours. It's a 200 page textbook. And to attend, all you have to, and you can stream it live. We'll let you stream while we're at the university. And all you have to do is make a $29 donation to charity. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. Thanks for listening to the Retirement Education Hour. Be sure to follow or subscribe when listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And now back to the show. Today, we're talking about risk, your risk in retirement. How much risk are you taking? How much can you take or should you take? We're really drilling into that extensively here on the program. And Kirk, you gave us all some homework, I noticed. You said, hey, if we were to have a 2008-like event again here in 2024, how would our portfolio, how would our nest egg, all that we've saved for retirement, be impacted? I don't really even know how to begin to figure that out, but I'm guessing many of us would have a very large impact. Well, yes, of course we would. And, and I'm not trying to intentionally sort of cherry pick, uh, you know, one of the worst times we've had in decades. I, that, that isn't the point. The point is trying to help you to better understand what do these labels mean? What does it mean to be a conservative investor or moderate or moderate aggressive? What do these things mean? Because honestly, we would argue, and what we teach in our classes is to stop letting your advisors, your teams in our industry put these silly labels on you. They need to talk numbers with you because talk about setting yourself up for failure in retirement, right? The goal in retirement is that no matter what short-term market event that occurs, whether it's a, an election you don't like, a 2008 event, which was a short-term event, by the way, from a market perspective, or a COVID event. All of these are short-term market events, and none of them should change your spending behaviors in retirement. And if they do, well, then you've got too much risk in your portfolio. And the reason you have too much risk in your portfolio is because you really have no idea what it means. You have no idea what the numbers are. So I thought this segment, Paul, let's talk about 
If you're a moderate investor in 2000, I'll go through them all. Ready? If you are a conservative investor in 2008, you would have lost somewhere between 17 and 23 percent. A moderate investor in 2008 lost about 37 percent, a three standard deviation event. That's what happened in 2008. A three standard deviation event is a moderate, a 60-40 portfolio. A moderate investor lost 37%. The average consumer thinks a moderate investor would have only lost 20 to 25%. No, it's 37%. Now, a, a, a moderate aggressive investor lost about 45 to 47%. So if you were 75 in stocks, 25 in bonds, you lost. 45 to 47 percent now now hear me when i'm saying this our intention here is not to scare you away from being aggressive the intent is and keep listening we're going to keep talking about it is the plan when i'm going to spend particular dollars in my plan which should be mapped out before you retire you should know what dollars are being spent where, and you should have different buckets of money for different phases of your retirement. And each of these different buckets should have different risks associated with them. Paul, I'm sorry, I get very passionate about this because I, I, I know what the industry does. They just put everyone in 60-40 and take 4% out. No planning, no risk mitigation. They don't have to do anything. It's crazy. Yeah, you know those numbers... I mean, those numbers blow me away when I hear them, right? I mean, I guarantee you, most listeners, when they thought they were conservative or they assumed they were moderate based on whatever they agreed with their advisors, they did not know those numbers. And, you know, I I think it, I I don't know if we have time to get, I think part of the disconnect, you know, as I was thinking about this topic, I decided to, to see what different, you know, what are the big firms, how do they define risk tolerance? I, I was just curious to see, okay, well, you know, we, we're going to talk about the way you should do it, but what are they saying? And every single one of them, no matter what the definition is, there was one word that was consist, consistent in all of them. And the word was willing. How much risk are you willing to take? Everything was about willing, as if somehow it's about how you feel. It's about what your comfort is, right? If, this has nothing to do with how you feel. It's nothing to do with your comfort. It's all about the numbers. It's what your capacity is. And I think that disconnect starts with how the, the, our industry defines this thing called risk tolerance as if it's personal. If it's about your feelings, your feelings have nothing to do with this. Well, if, it, if they're going to depend on feelings, and, I, and that's, the, that's the problem. They're banking you on reacting and using your feelings to decide these things. Because For sure. Because as you age, we, we say it all the time, old, older people aren't cheap. They're scared. The reason they don't spend is because they're fearful. They're scared. And the less you spend, and anyone that's listened to our radio show for a long time or come to our classes, you know what you know this. I, we constantly tell you, the less you spend, the more your advisors in the financial service industry makes. There is no incentive to eliminate the fear for you. So feelings is what they want you to drive all your decisions on and as opposed to the math. What do I need to give me what I want? And when am I spending these dollars? What is my capacity? Paul nailed it. What is my capacity for risk? What should it be based upon when I'm spending those dollars? If I'm spending these dollars in the first five years, your capacity is none. I don't want risk. We can't have volatility. We got to eliminate that sequence of returns risk. But if we're not spending those dollars for 10, 15, 20 years in your plan, those should be aggressive. You see, it is far more nuanced. And that's why the class is eight hours. That's why it's like a master's level course. That's why they're taught in universities. I'm going to encourage people to come in person, but we have people all over the country that are attending virtually so they can participate. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. We just ask you to make a $29 donation to charity. We'd love to see you at the class. Listening from outside Michigan or Missouri? We stream courses live from the university so you can attend anywhere in the country. Go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org to sign up. And now back to the show. 
Want to make sure we jump back into this topic on risk today. And if you're like me, maybe you heard Kirk and Paul say something and you wanted to share it with your spouse or you just wanted to try to recall it. You're able to do that. You can find this very program and all of our programs in our library, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Simply search for the name of the show, Retirement Education Hour. All right, Kirk and Paul, we're often told regarding risk, hey, you've got to know how much risk you can take. I get that, I guess. But what you're saying is different. You're saying you really need to know what dollars you're going to spend when in retirement. And that leads you to understand risk. Do I have that correct? You nailed it. Better than we said it, in fact, because the difference is your risk between our industry defines this as, a, as risk tolerance. Now, as we are approaching retirement or even in retirement, it really becomes about risk capacity. What do we mean risk capacity? In our last segment, I talked about the amount of risk your dollars should be exposed to should be based upon when those particular dollars are going to be spent throughout your retirement. So this is the problem for most of you. Most of you don't know what dollars are being spent when, because most of you don't have a plan. A dial isn't a plan. A probability of success is not a plan. The 4% rule, unfortunately, is you know relatively safe. 3 to 4% is safe. But it's about half of what you really could spend if you had a real plan. I mean, that's what we teach in the classes. So you can have, spend five, six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates per year when you retire. And the way to do that is not feelings, not a general risk profile, but it's risk capacity. Because you, if you map out, and this is what we teach in the class, or you can go online and look at what a sample plan looks like. Go to our charity's website and go look at a sample plan. It's a webinar, 30 minutes. If you know when your dollars are being spent, different dollars throughout your retirement are being spent, well, then you can structure your investments accordingly based upon when you're spending those dollars. The longer before we need to spend those dollars, the much more aggressive. If I'm not touching the dollars for 10, 15, 20 years, I can be 100% owning index. Just buy the index. If I'm spending the dollars in the first three, four, five years, we have to be like super defensive. And we also have to have, and we'll get into this later, a pivot account that is not exposed to market risk so that when we have those major market events, I don't have to change my spending patterns. I don't have to worry about outliving my money. I just pivot to a different account to take my income from that wasn't exposed to the risk. You see, so the point is your, your plan drives your risk. What you should be investing in is driven by your plan. And all of you guys, all you're doing is someone's giving you a label and you're, they're selling you products. And your products and results of your products will drive what your plan is. That is simple, easy, lazy, and is a 100% certainty that you will underspend what you otherwise could be spending, and that is exactly what the financial service industry wants. The less you spend, the more they make. That's why they do it this way, Paul. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, really, it makes me really, angry. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's okay. no, it, me as well. It really flies in the face of these simple rules that we use. And and as you're talking, I'm, I think about target dated funds, right? I mean, here's the crazy thing: it's, it seems so obvious. You could take two 65 year old people. One who plans, to, who's still working, and one who retired last year, right? One who needs income now, one who won't need income for five years. Obviously, how those, you know, how their monies are allocated are very differently. It's based on capacity. But when we use these simple rules, rule of a hundred, right, or these target dated funds, it's based on the 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 idea that you're all the same. The two sixty five year olds are the same. You're not the same. It's all when you need the money. And that's all about risk capacity. It's not about risk tolerance. Paul, you nailed that. That was great. And so so the challenge, the challenge is, you see, these rules were designed to hit the masses, right? They want to be able to cover as many people with as much generality as they can to make things simple. And the problem for our listeners, you all need to hear me when I say this. Please hear what the words that I'm going to give you right now. The average baby boomer. Today, the average baby boomer right now will retire with $200,000 saved. That's it. 
They will have $200,000 saved at retirement. In fact, almost 40% of baby boomers, all they will have is Social Security in retirement. Now, we know many of our listeners, those who regularly listen to us, tend to have 700 to 10 million. You guys tend to have a lot more than the average baby boomer. The people attending our classes tend to have a lot more than the average baby boomer. And as a result, you can't follow those general rules. You shouldn't own target data. You shouldn't have just a one portfolio 60-40 that they're just drawing off of. Your plan of when you're going to spend the dollars and your investments should match your plan. The plan dictates what you invest in. This is why, Paul, and it's sad to say that 80% Baby boomers will die with 80% of their wealth still that they had when they began retirement. They're not going to spend their money. They're not going to spend it because of fear and using general rules that were designed for the average baby boomer with $200,000 saved. Come to an eight-hour course. It's like a master's level course taught at major universities and colleges in your area. All you have to do is make a $29 donation to charity. We would encourage you to attend in person. I'm going to tell you if you come virtually, you're going to want to come back in person, but we do have people all over the country watching virtually while we stream the classes live from the universities. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. Classes are forming now. Go to retirementplanningedu.org to register. Again, that's retirementplanningedu.org. Use the promo code PODCAST to receive 50% off your tuition. And now, back to the show. Today, we're talking about risk, and I want to jump back into this important topic with Kirk and Paul. We've got a lot of volatility in the world today, and so risk is on a lot of people's minds. And we're going to keep discussing that and how you can make sure you are, you're invested appropriately. Okay, so, you know, we talked about the financial industry, Kirk and Paul, and how they tend to look at risk differently, and you would say maybe incorrectly, setting people up for potential failure here in this area. Tell us why they still do it this way. Why are they leading people potentially down the wrong road when it comes to evaluating risk? Well, uh, here, so so a couple things. Yeah, I was listening to you tee up this segment and introduce the class, and you, and I was thinking, if I'm a listener, eight hours in a classroom, how can, how much, what are you doing in eight hours? I will. Here's the promise. I I promise everyone that attends this course that that here's the the promise. It's not my promise. It's the charity's promise. If you don't leave that course better prepared for retirement, like significantly changing your retirement, meaning spending more, retiring early, paying less taxes, if that if those things aren't happening, we'll make a $2,000 donation to whatever charity you want, right? And I'll tell you, when you come away from the class, instead of it, you would, you, you'll say, why wasn't this three days or 12 hours? Well, because I'm already having, we're already having trouble getting you to commit to eight hours, right? And then when you're there, you want more. And that's why people tend to come back regularly to the courses. And it's because we have to, we have to teach you why the industry teaches what they teach and gives you the services they give you and then give you the correct approach. So you then can go out and find the right teams to help you. Because most of the teams aren't doing right. Most of the teams are following these general rules around everything related to retirement, especially risk profile in terms of how much risk your portfolio, because it's simple. You see, it's all about they want to create feelings and fear as you age so that you will spend less because the less you spend, the more they make. And to do that, they will simplify things. They're not going to give you individual plans. They're going to give you one bucket of money, 60-40. You're a moderate investor. Take out your 4%. And when things get bad, the markets get bad, or you don't like the election, maybe back down your spending, cut back a little bit. It's because it's more profitable. It's easier to scale. Think about it from a business owner perspective. If you're a business owner, you want to th- do things that are easy, repetitive, that you can scale, and that's going to make you the greatest amount of margin. Well, simplicity is easier than complexity. So they're going to avoid complexity. And if they're doing it right, if they're really 
focus instead of on risk tolerance, risk capacity, that would mean they would have to build you a plan, not use eMoney or Money Guide Pro to give you a dial of probability of success. No, literally map out all of your assets, when you're going to spend what dollars from which accounts, and then have tons of different buckets of money with different risk profiles for all of them, and every year have to adjust those buckets of money because you're getting one year closer to needing to spend those dollars. And if they do that effectively, that's what drives performance, that's what drives greater income. You're managing something called sequence of returns risk, but that is so hard. It's so individualized, and it's so much less profitable. Paul, what did I miss? Well, you know, no, I think you nailed it. And, and I, you know, I, I would just add that, you know, fear is a powerful emotion. And, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it, it, it is ingrained in us, right? Fear is very powerful. And if you can tap into that fear, you can motivate people. And I think when you look at, we don't have time again, I think when you look at how our industry defines risk tolerance and how they use it to get you to do what you they want you to do, so much, so mu- so much of it is based on, you know, eliciting fear. They know, especially as you get older, you're going to worry. So what do they do? They don't focus on risk capacity. They focus on risk tolerance, which is all about your comfort level, all about what you're willing to endure. And they know you're not willing to endure a lot because they know you're older and they know you're scared and they do that purposely so that you, as Kirk, you always say you spend less. So much of this is driven on tapping into your emotion rather than looking at data and looking at capacity. And, and again, I think this is where the class is so powerful because the class helps people understand, put aside your emotions, put aside how you, what your comfort level is. Let's look at what you can really afford based on your plan, based on what you want in the future, not your neighbor's. And when you need those dollars, you nailed it. I mean, it, that's exactly right. Paul, see, the difference is when you're younger, they're doing a disservice even for younger people with this whole feelings, risk tolerance stuff. That's It's wrong. No, your job is in the industry. You're the doctor. You're supposed to prescribe. It's not supposed to be a collaboration. When you have the right team that's doing the right things. That's what the class does is to help you know, do you have the right teams? Do I need, can I trust them? How do I know if I have the right teams? That's what we teach in the class because this isn't supposed to be a collaboration. When you're young, you're supposed to be aggressive. The money you're not spending for retirement, everything in your force should be 100% in index. You shouldn't own bonds. This whole tolerance feeling is backwards. Come to an eight-hour class. It will make sense because you will understand what real planning is, and you'll learn that planning drives everything. The plan dictates everything you own and how much risk you take. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. To find our latest white papers and webinars, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. And remember to subscribe or follow wherever you listen to your podcasts. And now back to the show. We've focused on risk today here on the program. And what I've come to understand so far, Kirk and Paul, is that risk is not a feeling, right? When I think about my spouse, and I'm sure many of our listeners are like that, Uh, or like this, you know, I'm a more conservative person when it comes to risk taking. My husband, he's much more risky than I am when it comes to our financials. But this is not about how I feel or how he feels. And I wondered if you could explain this again, your risk tolerance versus your risk capacity and how that could impact you as an investor in retirement. So, Megan, I think what may be helpful is if we could just give a couple definitions. You know, in preparing for the show we thought it would be interesting just to see how these large wirehouses are defining risk tolerance. And, and you're going to notice that in, I'm going to give three and you're going to notice in all three, they're almost exactly the same. And it's all about what you just said about you and your husband, which is, it's all about, you know, your, how, what your personality is, how you feel about things it has nothing to do with capacity. So three different definitions. One defined it as the degree of risk, that investor is willing to endure given the volatility in the value of an investment. So in that, what an investor is willing to endure, I mean, how do they feel about enduring it? The second one was risk tolerance is the amount of market volatility and loss you're willing to accept as an investor. Again, 
It's how much you are willing to accept. Not what you can afford to accept, but what you're willing to accept. The third one was the amount of risk you're willing to take given market volatility based on, quote, your comfort level. Now, you talked about you and your husband. You, you naturally have different comfort levels, right, about, about risk and how comfortable you are with it. Maybe you're less comfortable than him. And that's what our industry uses to help people when they, build, you know, when they have invest your money based on your comfort level. Kirk, how is that different than risk capacity? <laughs> it's, I'm sorry I laugh because it is, first of all, they're setting people up for failure right off the bat. I, I, people don't probably re recognize this, but since 1980, on average, this is on average, we experience a drawdown, meaning the market goes down over 14% on average every single year at some point in the year. So that fact would freak out many people, particularly once you retire and someone else isn't sending you a paycheck. That will scare people. They are intentionally having you do everything based upon feelings and emotions as opposed to what do I need to give me what I want and what does my plan tell me I need to do and when? See, here's the crazy thing. This is where I think we can really get people's attention because everyone approaching retirement is all, everything has been focused on performance and growth, performance and growth in Sadly, that's what they think is going to drive success in retirement. And it's not. We've talked about this forever. And as we're going through the show, I'm thinking, we didn't talk about sequence of returns risk. And here's an interesting fact. If someone took your money and you said, I'm a moderate, I want moderate risk. In fact, maybe a little less than moderate. How about we go 50% stocks, 50% bonds, and we just take our money out of that bucket of 50-50 stocks, bonds for the rest of our lives, and that's how we're going to live. Okay, so if I do that and I'm taking my money out of the 50-50 portfolio, when the markets are down, I'm taking money out. When the market's up, I'm taking money. When we have an intra-year drawdown of 14% in a year, I'm taking money out. This is called sequence of returns risk. This destroys your retirement. This is why you can only take 3 to 4% out if you follow the general rules. Now, I could build you a portfolio, and I could show it. If come to the class, I'll show you because we do this, where we have a 40-60 portfolio, only 40% of the money in stocks and 60% of the money in bonds. And that portfolio will way outperform. It won't even be close. It won't even... Over a 25-year period, over 100% more real return over your retirement because you are setting up your risks based upon when you're spending the dollars. In other words, I won't be, this is what we teach in the class, in other words, you will not be pulling money out of a market investment when the portfolios are down, which happen on average every year at about 14%. So as long as you have some place to pivot or an account for your short-term money to draw from, then we can be very aggressive on the long-term money, and we are never withdrawing when the markets are down. This is eliminating sequence of returns risk. This will drive the performance. This will drive the success. It's also what drives your ability to have a 6 or 7 or 8% withdrawal rates, meaning you could take out a lot, instead of taking, if you have $2 million saved for retirement, instead of taking out 4% and living on $80,000 a year, you could take out 7 or 8% and have $150,000, $160,000 a year. If you manage your risk based upon the cap risk capacity instead of risk tolerance. In other words, your plan's going to dictate how much risk you take with all of your different dollars. So if you want, I know this is complicated. That's why it's almost, it's, it's like a master's level course. That's why it's in universities and it's why it's eight hours. Okay. So I'm going to encourage you, even if you're not in Michigan or in Missouri and you can't attend in person, attend virtually. All you have to do is make a $29 donation to charity. If you'd like to register, go to retirement planning edu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. Thanks for listening to the Retirement Education Hour. Be sure to follow or subscribe when listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And now back to the show. 
back to risk. Kirk and Paul, you've articulated how big an impact risk capacity versus risk, risk tolerance can have on our retirements. What is the antidote here to making sure you're looking at it correctly for your own situation? So for our regular listeners, you know what this segment is about. The segment is about what the solutions always are. Well, first it's education. You know that. It's after a decade of teaching over 10,000 people at major universities and colleges in your areas, we've learned a lot. And we also have learned how to most effectively help you to be able to retire sooner and spend a lot more money in retirement. In many cases, when you're done with this class, you will be armed with the knowledge to find the right teams to help you to have withdrawal rates of six, seven, eight percent instead of three or four percent and pay significantly less taxes because of the some of the advanced tax strategies that are being taught. It's an eight hour course. And I'm going to tell you, everyone that attends wishes it was a 12 hour course. So this risk tolerance versus risk capacity is one of the keys to driving performance, success, and maximizing income. It is mapping out a 30-year plan, knowing exactly what accounts you're going to pull money from and when, making sure that you have multiple accounts, pivot accounts, because you see, you don't We don't market time investments. You market time your income. You're trying to manage and take income from accounts that don't have exposure to market risk when the market's down. And when the market's up, then we can pivot back to the accounts that have market exposure. So it's about income planning. So with income planning, then we now know what we need to give us what we want and when. And once we know what we need to give us what we want and when, we then can manage risk based upon capacity instead of your feelings and emotions. That is the core here, at the core of this. Now, now the one thing I wanna say before I pass it to Paul is, understand the eight hour class is, there's a lot of information. I would encourage you to go out to the Cherry's website to look at what a sample plan looks like. It's a 30 minute webinar on what we teach in the class, what a sample plan looks like. And it gives you a better understanding of how advanced this course is and the strategies we're using. But one of the last things, Paul, I think is really important is being able to find the right teams to help you. And we spent a good 45 minutes to an hour teaching people how people in our industry get paid, what a real plan looks like, understanding all the levers, how to do background checks, specific questions they should be asking the different advisors and teams out there so you can find the people that can provide you the right type of planning Planning focus on risk capacity instead of risk tolerance. It shouldn't be a collaboration, folks. You do not know more than the experts. You got to find the right team that you trust so that they can give you the best outcomes. And the plan will dictate what you should own and how much risk you should take. Paul, I'm sorry. No. So, you know, as I was listening, I'm thinking, for, for those of you listening, if you want to determine whether you are with an advisor that really is doing planning, The simplest way to determine that is, are they doing a risk assessment before or after the plan? If they are doing a risk assessment, if they're asking you how much risk you want to take before they actually did the plan, they're not planning. Because at the end of the day, if they were planning, they need to know your risk capacity, and that only can be determined once the plan is done. So a really easy way to determine whether you have an advisor that's doing planning is, do they determine your risk based on a plan they created or they did, that, did they ask you a whole bunch of questions when they first met you? If they did that, then they're not doing real planning. Well, you know the answer to that, Paul, right? I mean, uh, that's the big key It was rhetorical. The, it was. Uh, it was. So that's the eye-opening thing when people come to the class. They recognize, oh, my God, I can retire, f- in many cases, five years earlier, and I can have significantly more money and a lot less fear because I understand my risk capacity. I understand This isn't breakable. I now know what I can do when I can do it and how it's working because you have the knowledge. And oh, by the way, save in many cases hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes because I've now learned what a real plan is. And I can now be I'm informed enough to go find a real team to help me, the right team. And Paul, you're you nailed it. You're right. Your risk tolerance, your feelings don't it shouldn't matter. It's your plan dictates that. So 
Attend one of our eight-hour courses. They're taught at most of the major universities and colleges in your area, and we stream it live just in case you're not in one of the areas. All you have to do is make a $29 donation to charity. If you'd like to register, go to retirementplanningedu.org. That's retirementplanningedu.org. Retirement Education Foundation is a fiscally sponsored program of United Charitable, a registered 501c3 public charity. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any insurance discussed in this show is backed by the financial strength and claims paying abilities of the issuing carrier. This radio show is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions, nor should it be construed as advice designed to meet the particular needs of an individual's situation. Retirement Education Foundation is not permitted to offer, and no statement made during this show shall constitute tax or legal advice. Our firm is not affiliated with or endorsed by the U.S. government or any governmental agency. The information and opinions contained herein provided by third parties have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed by Retirement Education Foundation. This radio show is paid for by the Retirement Education Foundation.